Hello, this is Sea Hedgehog, and you're here again on my channel, Adjust in Sober Earnest. And I think I forgot my cookie. Hold on one sec. Well, shit. This is off to a great start. I was watching Squirmy and Grubs, which is another oh, baby, another YouTube channel, and they did a Vogue prompt, and I thought the questions were interesting, so I thought I would do it but I haven't thought through any of these responses. So this should be interesting. This is generally how I do these prompts, which is probably a terrible way to do it. So the first question is, what's the best thing that you've done this month? Um, best thing. So my first two years of schooling, out of eight years, um, finished about a month ago, um, maybe slightly more than a month ago. And it's kind of exciting because they're called the book learning years. So even though I'm going to grad school and I will be doing more book learning, it's not the same type of book learning as I was doing for those two years. So it, even though it makes up a, a, frac a small fraction, one fourth of my time at, in like this program, um, it does have a meaning. <laughs> so that's kind of exciting. Um, I've also been attending lab meetings for the lab that I'm going to join, so that's equally exciting. Um, everyone's super nice, always what you want, yeah. Something that you're tired of, studying every day, <laughs> could be done with that in like, you know, like, how many days? Four days. <laughs> um, what's, what's something that recently moved you? So um, I watch a lot of other YouTube channels over like a variety of um, topics. And in particular, there is somebody that I've been following since I first had a Google account. And it's not this account, it's a different account that I had. It's associated with my name. And I don't know, I don't wanna be an idiot online. So that's why I have two accounts, but this was a girl that I started following, like, I want to say it was like in high school or middle school, and her name is Cat Black. I don't know if anybody is familiar with her, um, but recently she does these like, these like tea time talks. I also have tea, um, but unlike Cat Black, um, my tea is not secretly wine, boxed wine, and I have a cookie. <laughs> Um, so I've been listening to Cat Black's videos for a really long time because she used to be, um, like a very significant member in like the feminist atheist community online. Um, <coughs> and in particular in middle school and high school, that was a time period when the atheist community online was significantly smaller than it is now. Um, on YouTube in particular, and it was like more singular in identity and um, beliefs. So it ended up being very misogynistic. It was actually kind of interesting. So like this whole like Gamergate business kind of started in online atheism. So obviously as a woman, this kind of like MRA exclusionary shit was not at all what I was interested in as an atheist online. Um, and I didn't come from a particularly religious household that like harmed me psychologically in some way. Um, but the place, the town that I grew up in and the area of the country that I grew up in is very strongly religious. And so I did want to, I did want to contact people online so that I could find like one other atheist to talk to and kind of like talk about some of the frustrations. I mean, it's the frustrations that you have with any sort of, I don't know, any sort of unique or rare um, belief or interest. Like, you know, you've got the parents that are always saying, oh, like you'll change your mind when you get older or other equally hurtful and frustrating things. Um, so I started following her and it was just really, um, like really encouraging and enlightening. And I always felt like 
her contribution to the community was worthwhile. Um, and I appreciated that she was putting her information, her like beliefs online so openly. Um, so she recently, so, so the, the, uh, the title of the, the movie, the, the title of the video is Why is Left Tube So White? And so it's kind of talking about, um, like, just, uh, kind of the hard, the hard reality of being both black and American in a country that is increasingly mainstreaming white nationalist beliefs and having like your very real concerns about your like livelihood or even life itself being questioned and having to have like a white person explain it for you because you saying that you're afraid isn't enough and um that really hit me um I think that, like, obviously I have no idea what it's like um, to be a minority, um, a person of color in the United States, like, I could imagine, based on what's been going on in popular culture, that that would be um, very difficult. <laughs> um, but you could just see, like, her conviction and her point and her argument was just like so clear and so um like important and impactful that it made a huge impact on me um and i encourage you all to watch it if that's something that you're interested in um if you could teach one subject in school what would it be um, I don't know. I think it would kind of depend on it, it, the, the, my answer would depend on kind of a, a specific to the question, like why would I be teaching it? There are certain things that I feel like are extremely important to be taught, but maybe I don't think that I'm the best person to be teaching it. However, if no one else is volunteering themselves, I feel like, like I would step into that role had if had I had a teaching degree for example I think like sex education and all of and all that that entails in my school it was like dual sex and like drug education um is extremely important especially in this country um because you can't count on parents to do it um for the children for their own children and I think that there's a lot of misinformation, like as somebody who comes from, or who's on a path that's like very scientific and very biology based, it becomes increasingly frustrating to live in a country that enshrines pseudoscience surrounding um, like sex or STIs or pregnancy into law. Um, and I think that a good, an, an important or necessary step to um, kind of addressing this problem systemically that we continue to have like lawmakers and reporters and presidents and whatever who just like routinely get facts about human biology incorrect and then write that misinformation into law, part of addressing that systemically is teaching everyone in the nation how sex works and how consent works and how biology of like your reproductive tract works and what forms of contraception are effective and um, like what, I don't know, like, <laughs> what forms of birth control are most effective, what are myths, etc. Um, so that would be something I would be interested in teaching. I think interests wise, um, I'd probably be happier teaching like a sewing or art class or a biology class. Um, but again, I don't think that has the same need in this country. So to a certain extent, I feel like 
like had that been my path that might feel like my duty to step in and do something about it because I do think it's that important. Um, what's your favorite beverage? <laughs> Ooh. Um, my favorite beverage is tea, Earl Grey specifically. Um, Lady Grey is fine. I have no um, disputes or quabbles with Lady Grey. Um, I like it equally to Earl Grey. It just has to be strong and I have to be able to taste the bergamot in it. I've also had Italian Grey, equally delicious. Yeah, it's it's the orange rind flavor that I'm attached to. Um, what's your favorite cocktail? So I don't normally drink. And part of the reason that I don't is because the migraine preventative medication that I'm on is extremely sedating. And so in combination with alcohol, I find that my tolerance is just not great. Um, not ever like blackout. So perhaps my tolerance is higher than I think it is. So I don't normally drink. However, and I also don't like the taste of most alcohol. However, I do like um, a margarita. I tend to like things with tequila in them, which is kind of strange. I kind of like the taste of tequila, like, which is super bizarre because people drink it because it has no taste and also think it tastes awful. But I don't know what to tell you. Um, I had a, um, a roommate who was obsessed with Moscow mules. So I've had several of those as well and I enjoy them. Um, and we would routinely joke that we were going to have like white Russians with our cookies, but then we always amended that virgin white Russians because a white Russian is milk and vodka. So you just have the milk with the, the brownie. I, that, that is the one form of a, <laughs> a, that is the one alcoholic beverage that I think I can, uh, confidently say I never want to taste ever. Just no. I, milk and vodka, I just, no. Um, what's your favorite birthday cake? My favorite birthday cake is there is a like generic brand of baking chocolate called Baker's Chocolate. And on the back of the recipe, and on the back there's a recipe. And when I was really little, like maybe in first grade, I found the Baker's Chocolate and I thought this was like the most legit recipe you've ever seen in your life because you had to separate the egg and separately beat the egg white and then put all the ingredients together. Um, and so that has been my birthday cake every year. I don't like it with icing. It has to be straight out of the oven. Basically, it tastes like a really fluffy but also fudgy brownie, which seems like it would contradict, but it actually doesn't. It's delicious. Um, this is a... Uh, a peanut butter cookie, so I'm trying not to touch it because it's super oily. I'm not even hungry, but I really don't like stale peanut butter cookies, and so I feel like I should eat it. <laughs> what one thing do you still have from your childhood? Yeah, we're gonna be gross here and I'm gonna talk with food in my mouth. Um, I think I have my rock collection. I think it's still at my parents' house. And also my massive briar horse collection. I mean, it's not super massive. Well, depending upon your definition of massive. I think I have like something like 20 horses or something. Um, in various states of scratch, damage, and disrepair. I think bodies is what they're now called. I have bodies. I guess because their, their heads aren't camera ready. Um, What's your favorite movie? I really like um, two different movies. One is The Fall by Tarzan Singh. He's an interesting director. Whoever does the cinematography, I don't know if he's the one who thinks it up or if he's got some cameraman that's fantastic, but the composition of every shot is just unbelievable. And then um, he also, 
until she died of cancer um, mid uh, mid the Snow White Mirror Mirror movie. Um, he employed the most fantastic costume designer, in my opinion, who has ever existed, which is probably like a little insane, but I just love her. Her name is Iko Ishioka. Um, and her costumes are just amazingly creative. They're beautiful. Um, so that's part of the reason why I like the fall. Um, I don't know if I've talked about it before on this channel. The plot is, it's about this stuntman. It, it won't spoil the story because all of this happens before the end of the credits. So it's one of those movies with the credits in the beginning and then the movie starts. So it's a um, stuntman who is performing a stunt over a river. The um, movie director keeps pushing and pushing and pushing him to do this super dangerous stunt. The train like catches him, he falls off the bridge and he ends up totally paralyzed from the waist down, I think. Or maybe missing a leg, I forget. <laughs> Oh well. Um, and he realizes that the relationships that he's formed with the people on set weren't real. Um, and they were really only nice to him because he was on the set and he was the stuntman. So he was under the impression he um, had a chance with the, um, the leading lady in the film and she doesn't come and see him in the hospital. Um, and the movie starts with him in his bed I guess I should say trigger warning, so you should probably skip forward um, if you are like depressed or anything like that. Okay, we're gonna keep going. Um, he's considering committing suicide, um, and he decides that he's going to convince this um, Romani girl who has fallen um, from fallen from a tree picking oranges with her family. And that's why she's at the hospital. He's going to convince her to give him enough morphine tablets that he can commit suicide. Um, but the story is a story that he tells her. It's kind of like Princess Bride. So he's telling her a story to make friends with her and kind of win her over so that he can get these drugs. Um, but instead, they the movie is about the relationship they form and kind of this Romani girl's just endless enthusiasm and lust for life and um, love of other people. It's just a really great movie. Sorry, this is my cat. And then the second movie is called Phoebe in Wonderland. I don't know if anybody's seen it. Um, it has L. what is her name? Elle Fanning in it. And it is about a young girl um, who stars in a play and the relationship that she forms with her, um, theater teacher. It's pretty good. But just like a totally different movie, um, and kind of like, it's, it's more story focused and like interaction focused than like big box office crazy costumes. What is something you can't do? So there's a tie for that. I can't whistle and also I can't snap with this hand and also I can snap with this hand but only with the most bizarre combination of fingers. I can only snap like this. Well I guess I can kind of snap like that but not like this. This is how my mom snaps. How do you snap? Does anybody snap like this? This is all I what is one habit you wish you could break? So I, I have this habit of like reflexively saying sorry. And it's sort of like, like the anxiety builds up and builds up and builds up until you like release it with a sorry. And it's a problem because depending upon the context, it's not appropriate or not needed. But also increasingly I'm finding um, for people who aren't from my area of the country, sorry means different things. So where I live, sorry can be like my regrets or my sympathies. 
So you're not apologizing for necessarily for something that you've done, but you're also, you're like apologizing, apologizing on behalf of humanity <laughs> for what has happened to this person. But people don't take it that way and people think that you're blaming yourself for whatever's going on with them. And then it becomes this whole awkward thing that I have to address. <laughs> So yeah, I wish I could, I wish, cause sometimes the, the sorry comes out before I've realized that I've said it. So I wish that my brain worked a little faster in those circumstances. Um, what makes you laugh no matter what? That's a good question. Maybe other people laughing, especially if they have a funny laugh or if they're just like totally overtaken with a laugh, it somehow becomes funnier. <laughs> Like they're, they're trying to maintain their composure, but they can't. That's funny to me. Um, I guess it's sort of like laughing in sympathy. <laughs> Why are you like this? You're lucky you're cute. What does creativity mean to you? I think creativity means I don't know it's I don't think it's necessarily like a totally unique idea like I definitely think like I don't think that um the dresses of the 1960s are any less creative because they were inspired by cuts of the regency period um I think it's creativity is like it's the way that you take something something that maybe people have seen before or maybe that people haven't seen before and you make something that makes someone else think so it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be extraordinary or crazy or wow it, but it, it's it's something it can be something like whatever you're feeling authentically or I guess not even necessarily that it doesn't have to be authentic. Or I guess the emotion you're conveying doesn't have to be authentic. I think the thought behind it has to be authentic. Because I think that's what people are responding to when they see creativity in something. They're looking at something and it stops them in their tracks, if only for a couple seconds. And they look at it and they see something of the person who made it. Um, so... Like, I don't think that you're beholden to a particular medium or a particular art style or that you're only beholden to doing art. I think that creativity can show up in other things. Um, for example, um, like sometimes in old houses, you can find people have added things that are kind of creative in a sense, like they're tired of something happening. Maybe they're tired of two doors getting tangled in the hallway. And so they come up with some creative solution so that it never happens by adding a little anchor to the door so you can't pull it out or a little door stopper or whatever. Um, but occasionally I'm someplace, or for example, there's an ice cream shop that I like to go to. And one of their doors, when you open it, it it's gonna, you, you can't totally flatten it back on the wall that it's open. And you can't do it because it would hit the molding on the other side of the wall. So somebody, some impatient genius person decided that they were going to trace the shape of the molding on the door frame and cut it out. I think that's creative. Um, it's a novel solution to a common problem. Um, but I don't necessarily think that creativity has to be a solution for something. So it's not really that either. I guess um, it's sort of like what was the Supreme Court justice who, when asked to define pornography, said, I don't know how to define it, but you know it when you see it. I feel like creativity is sort of that. It's, it's this, it, it, can't to it can't fully be pinned down. It's this constellation of things, but you know it when you see it. <laughs> what are your favorite lyrics of all time? Hmm, I don't know. I think it kind of varies on the mood that I'm feeling. Um, I like songs that kind of tell a story, um, unless I just need them for background music while I'm studying, which is frequently. Um, I think there's a song by Anais Michelle, 
Anais Mitchell. Um, it's called Before the Eyes of Storytelling Girls that I think I'll say for my answer um, right now. Um, it's kind of a warning for, um, I don't know, leaders of the world that when injustice happens and you do nothing to stop it or when you enforce um, like oppression or, um, vi or enact violence on others that there are people watching, story storytelling girls. Um, what's something you've always wanted to try but you've been too scared to do? Maybe traveling to a foreign country, not necessarily alone, but like not with a huge group of people. I think that, am I wearing this shirt inside out? <laughs> I'm wearing this shirt inside out. Okay, well, awesome. I was just feeling around the edge and I was like, what? What is this seam allowance doing right here? Anyway, um, yeah. So I think my a lot of the people that I know like to go really nice places when you're when they're traveling, um, and they're not hikers. I am by no means a camper, but I am a hiker. I think it's enjoyable to just go out and I don't know take like a two-hour walk or a four-hour walk through the woodlands or whatever, and that would not be <laughs> something that a lot of the people that I know would be interested in, or even necessarily that they could do. Um, They've got, they've got knees that are less tolerant <laughs> of that sort of thing than mine. So, um, yeah. But I think that would be really fun. Like walking the Great Wall of China, going to Iceland, and like hiking along the beachfront. I think that there are loads of places in the world that would be beautiful to visit, beautiful wildlife to see important and significant monuments, um, stories of peoples that have existed long before my time. Um, best advice for your 19 year old self. Um, surprisingly, that one thing that you thought that you could never do because there are too few people who are doing it, you should play. Cause you'll get it. <laughs> who knew? <laughs> if you could raid one woman's closet, who would it be? Okay. So I don't think that I would actually do this because um, no doubt people have been exploited in making this gown. <laughs> um, and it's not just not not just your own people, but like colonial peoples have been exploited to make this gown because it has like thousands of miniature of, of thousands of tiny beetle wings <laughs> sewn onto it and it's just insane but there's this lady her name is lady curzon and she was who are you lady curzon she was the viscerine of india so England, when they took over India, sent British people there to enforce like the will of the British crown over the people of India. So that was her position. Um, so this would probably require me to break into a museum. Um, and I don't necessarily know that I'd want to wear it or remove it from where it is, but I would, and not even necessarily touch it. I would like to see the inside of it, and I would like to see what the little beetles look like. <laughs> I really want that. Yeah, so I don't know if that's technically like raiding someone's closet, but that if, if, I, if there was one dress that I wanted to see with mine own eyes, that is one of them. Another one, and I was so disappointed, <laughs> is there is a gown that was dug up on a dead body in a bog in Ireland called uh, I think it's called like Moy Bog and it's called the Moy Gown 
and it is a an intriguing piece of engineering. The pattern pieces are extremely unique and very bizarre. Like the 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 arms have little shoulder blade cutouts that are sewn into the dress. It's super bizarre. And I literally went to Ireland and went to the city where the dress is and went into the museum where the dress is stored. And I go up to the front desk and I'm like, I'm here to see the Moy gown. Clueless. No one knows. And they have to like, you know, there's like people chattering like nervously, like, what is this like weird girl talking about? It's like three people down the chain of like so-and-so talks to so-and-so and that so-and-so talks to someone else and that finally somebody comes back and they're like, yeah, it's not on display right now. My one chance. <laughs> yeah, so I'd like to raid that. Whatever uh, pre-medieval lady had that gown, I want your closet. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was probably her one her one gown, but I want it. I want to see it. I want to see what it looked like and its originality because it's now like three small pieces like kind of stuck together. Um, I want to know what color it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, must have purse item. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, keys. But that's too lame. What else do I carry in my... Okay. This is, this is actually a joke, but it came out recently, so I figure I'll show someone. Oh, well. This is actually useful. This is my basic life certifier, whatever. Next to my, my mood frequent shoppers card and my AMA membership. <laughs> um. It ended up if you became a member of the AMA, you got a textbook discounted enough that it p paid for the membership. So I was like, sure, I'll become a member of the AMA. I'm also a member of my state's AMA. Um, I hope Mrs. Ford is pleased. Wait. I don't know if you can read this. It says, proud to be a chemist. Is it backwards? Yeah, so it says, as a chemist, my work contributes to the high quality of moral life. Chemistry is the key to solving many of Earth's problems. Chemicals help people live longer, healthier lives than ever before. And this was given to me in sophomore year of college. I don't know how long ago that was. It was a while. But it has a miniature periodic table. And this is totally useless but it pleases me that I have it for this long. Um, yeah, so this is <laughs> proud to be a chemist. Never majored in chemistry. Didn't enjoy chemistry, but I remember you, Mrs. Ford. <laughs> um, What do you want to do with your life at age 12? Great question. My parents thought I was either going to be a, um, an architect or a uh, penniless artist living in their attic. It turns out I did none of those things. An important life lesson for someone to learn. I think like learning how to be self-sufficient is incredibly important. I'm, I'm not gonna say that I have it all figured out. Just like, you know, like you can survive on your own. You've got this. We believe in you. I think it's important because then you don't feel like beholden to other people and what they want from you. You know that you're gonna be okay on your own, just chugging along on this hamster wheel. Um, and it's gonna be okay. And I think that's an important realization to have as like a, um, a pre-adult, um, <laughs> teenager. What's one goal you are determined to achieve in your lifetime? Get out of school. <laughs> um, no. Um, when I put Forever Student on my Instagram, 
I was kind of joking. Like it was kind of making fun of the fact that I'm gonna be in school for a really long time. But also I think to an extent, I wanna always be learning. Like I never, I don't think that you can ever be an expert in anything. There's always something else to learn. There's always a new direction. That's why I like research. There's always a new path. There's always something that somebody hasn't discovered. Even if you know everything there is to know that's currently available in a field, there's still um, like a path to, to move forward and to learn more. And so I don't know if that's necessarily an achievement, um, but I guess, yeah, I, do, I don't want to ever lose that. I think that it's that's an important philosophy to have or like a... I don't know, like refreshing or worthwhile philosophy to have. Um, I guess if we're achievement focused, maybe I would like, I'd like to discover something that somebody hasn't discovered before. It doesn't have to be big, it doesn't have to be different. Um, but yeah, I think it'd be fun to be able to bring something to the table and to be like, hey, I found this. What are we gonna do about it? Um, yeah. Would you ever live anywhere besides the city that I currently live in? Yes, get me the hell out of here. No, actually, I, I don't. I don't hate this city. Um, but as I alluded to earlier, I live in a very conservative region of the country. Not the South, but conservative. And as a result, there are certain policies, um, there are certain policies and certain ideas that I am not a fan of and I would like. I think idealistically people are always saying like, oh, like you should stay and you should be the one to change it. But to a certain extent, like, I think you deserve to live a life in a place where like you feel valued and accepted and you feel like you can succeed as the best the best person you can be and I don't necessarily know that that's here there are some very persuasive reasons for me to be here um, there's some important institutions that I enjoy being a part of and I highly benefit from being a part of um, but there are yeah there's there are policies in my state in my area of the country that I am not a fan of. Um, what's your favorite dessert? Peanut butter cookies? <laughs> Moist, not stale, peanut butter cookies. Um, is there a dessert you don't like? Most things that are chocolate flavored but have very little chocolate in them. So chocolate syrup, chocolate ice cream, chocolate whipped cream, chocolate mousse. I'm like sort of wishy-washy off. If it's like a brick of chocolate, yes. Especially dark chocolate, yes. High cocoa, yes. Um, I like chocolate cake. I like chocolate brownies. I like chocolate. I don't like fake chocolate. Um, it's brunch, what do you eat? I really like eggs benedict or oatmeal. What's your favorite painter? Hmm, great question. I have two real answers and one joke answer. The joke answer is Carl Kaler, Collar? He painted a painting called My Wife's Lovers, and it is a hundred something of Kate Birdsall Johnson's cats. And the reason it is my computer background, and the reason it has been my computer background for several years, is that I was attempting to troll the graduate student in my last lab. He made some cheeky comment about me having one cat, a single cat, in my computer background. So I made it my life's mission to slowly increase the number of cats in my computer background until it was solid cats. And my wife's lovers was a photo that included the most cats that I could find. Um, and he never noticed. It was very sad. A lot of my friends noticed, but he never noticed. 
He was my one cat friend in that entire lab. Everyone else liked dogs. Disappointed. Okay, so I like this photographer called Vivian Mayer. Um, I don't think that she was particularly famous when she was alive, but somebody that she nannied for found her photographs like in an attic or something and released them fairly recently. Um, and I really like, um, I like her portraits. Um, she took a lot of photographs of people, just like random people on the street. And I think that they're really interesting to look at and I'd like to know like more about those people. Um, and then another artist, an actual painter, I really like Vermeer, um, who was a Renaissance painter. Um, he's known for the girl with the pearl earring, but I actually enjoy his other paintings more. He was kind of famous for a hyper-realistic style, um, and he did a lot of things with, like, perspective and, like, uber detail of things in the background that I really appreciate. So like, I think if I remember correctly, he has one painting where, or he has several paintings where there are mirrors in the background and you can actually see in the mirror the back of the costume of whatever the person was wearing. And I think if I remember correctly, there was one where he actually painted a curved mirror and the backs of the, individuals costumes are contorted to the shape of the curved mirror which i think is just insane um so that level of precision i think is super interesting um yeah but i don't know much about art so like my artist recommended they're not like you know like super classy and i don't know discerning <laughs> um <laughs> Favorite Disney animal? I really like Scrat. <laughs> um, I feel like they kind of took the joke too far in the later Ice Age movies, but I just kind of liked like the short story of Scrat that was like interwoven between the story of Ice Age. I like Ice Age as a whole, um, just like as a movie. I think I've always been drawn to the animal movies of Disney. Um, or I don't even know if that was Disney, but I lumped them all together. Like I was really into The Lion King when I was younger. I used to watch it every night. Um, and I think that the message of Ice Age was really important to me as kind of like a younger kid. Um, it's about like making the family that like supports you and loves you for you regardless of who you are and where you come from and i think especially as someone who's adopted like i do feel very strongly or i'm like very passionate about the relationships that i've built between people not necessarily because we have some sort of genetic or biological connection to one another, but because I value them as a person and I love them as a person. Like they're, they're, they're not like family, they are family to me. And not just like my parents who legally adopted me, but um, there are several aunts that I have that are not legally or biologically related to me. Um, there are people that I consider my sisters who are not legally or biologically related to me. Um, and I think, I don't, not, like I don't wanna, it's not for me to say that biological connection to another person isn't important. But I think sometimes society seems to forget or not fully understand how you can like love and have a close connection with somebody that you aren't like legally bound to or biologically related to like your attachment to that person is because you love them for them and not because of some legal contract or like handful of genes that you share um and so i really liked that movie as a kid um what is a book you're planning on reading well 
it would it would be on my phone but my phone is filming this movie um alice isn't dead um which is by joseph fink and someone else but it doesn't say it on the thing um i don't know if anybody listens to um the podcast night veil um but it's by the same people i'm a huge night veil fan so yeah my sister lent me that book and so i'm gonna read it once i get out from under this avalanche um what did you read most recently i think i've already said that um it was called like the collected schizophrenias um and then i also read a book that i forget about um it was like a fantasy book it's gone i'll have to type it below sorry um favorite solo artist hmm I don't know that I have a favorite solo artist. Lots of people. I'm a huge Regina Spector fan, so we'll say that. Bye.